This video is for you guys, anyone going into industrial maintenance, electronics or instrumentation that's a little bit nervous about the job. I remember when I started, I really didn't know what to expect. I was also extremely nervous for months and months. And, um, you know, I got a, uh, one of my viewers requested to go over common components in an electrical panel. And I want to go through that with you guys. Uh, industrial maintenance, electronics, electrical technician, instrumentation, automation. It's all not super complicated. It can be, but at the base of it, it's really not that difficult. So I just want to give you guys a little bit of an exposure on what you can expect when you start working as a technician, show you some of the common components that are in a panel. Then we'll also kind of talk about how they function and uh, you know what they do in the real world. And hopefully by the end of this video, I can share a little bit of experience with you guys and you'll feel better about your first day at work. Throughout this video, I'll put up this panel on the screen. This is a panel that I build, I help design. And also I'll show you the components right here and we'll just talk about what they are. And I guess we'll start with the most important and that is your circuit breaker. Generally in industrial settings, you got 483 phase powering your devices. By no means does it have to be that, but more often than not, that's what you're gonna get. So you got your 483 phase and it comes in through your main circuit breaker. That, that device just protects everything else. Let's say, for example, after your circuit breaker, one of the wires got cut into and it's sparking and it's smoking, what's going to happen is it's going to increase your amp draw significantly. So say you run at 50 amps. Now all of a sudden you're running at, you know, 500 amps. And that circuit breaker is going to trip. There's a circuit breaker. When it trips, it's going to go, that's off, on. And it goes to the middle position that's tripped. So you go off and put it back on. So that's how you reset it. You can always use your multimeter to verify power. So there's your circuit breaker. As I said, it runs 483 phase, but a lot of times we use 120 volts for the controls, meaning, you know, push buttons. Oh, I don't have a push button up here. I got one somewhere. Anyways, push buttons, running your PLCs, float switches, pretty much everything other than motor power is your controls. And for your controls, sometimes what we'll do is we'll take that 480 and we'll drop it down to 120 volts using a transformer or a control transformer. Also, sometimes you'll have a power supply, which I don't have up here. And that power supply can take any input and turn it into 24 volts DC. 24 volts DC and 120 AC are common control voltages. Generally speaking, you're not gonna use those voltages to control motors and high powered devices. So you're gonna need to step it down. Control transformer, you can bring it down to 120 AC, sometimes 24 AC, or you can get a power supply that'll drop you down to DC. All right, next, so you got your um, main circuit breaker, then your power is gonna run through some fuses. This is a three phase, three phase uh, fuse block. So that would just be in line with whatever your motor is. You got the fuses, they're gonna be rated a little bit above whatever your motor power full amps is. And then also you're probably going to have some other smaller glass tube fuses or don't have to be, but you're going to have other fuses to fuse different circuits. Again, this is all just about protecting the device. When you have a short circuit, sparks are flying. You want that power to turn off to protect people, your equipment. You know, you run high current for too long. Your wires are going to melt. Things are going to catch on fire. We try to avoid fire. All right. So. That's your main circuit protection stuff, fuses, circuit breakers. Say you're turning on a three phase motor. So you're gonna run through something just like this. That's a small contactor. I don't know what size it is, maybe zero, zero. There's different sizes for you know different power capacities, what have you. But this is a three phase contactor or motor starter. So you get three phase going here. And when you energize the coil, this thing is gonna suck in. The coil is just a magnet that sucks in and it's gonna allow the power to run through and out to your motor. Right here, you got a overload attached. So that's another circuit protective device just for the wires going directly to the motor. You rate That's rated for a certain amperage based off whatever motor you're using. And if that trips out, you gotta reset it. This right here is two contactors next to each other, presumably a non-reversing contactor so you can run the motor forwards or you can run it backwards 
and you're just going to flip one of the sets of wires. So you can go forwards and run these. And then maybe let's say you flip these two wires and then turn on that one. And then it will run the same motor in reverse. It's non-reversing. I think that's what it's called because you can't run them both at the same time. God forbid you do. You're going to have a 480 volt short circuit and it's going to be like a small grenade going off. So there's always some sort of mechanical interlock in these non-reversing contactors because you don't want 480 going straight to 480. All right, so those are the main uh, control panel components. We also have relays. Here's a couple different relays right here. Um, relays serve a similar purpose as the contactor, but not quite the same. Uh, with a relay, basically you have a coil. So you're gonna send power to the relay coil, and then you'll have different sets of contacts within the relay. And those contacts are going to open or close, open or close, normally open or normally closed. They're going to, you know, turn things on and turn things off based off whether you're sending power to that relay coil. One of the advantages of using a relay is that you can, you know, there's a power rating going through those coils and usually it's about 10 amps. Um, there's, you know, obviously different types of relays, but general ice cube relays, you can, you know, supply, you can turn on or turn off power to a maximum 10 amp circuit through the relay contacts. Um, and then this right here is just a timer, uh, timing relay, same sort of deal, except, you know, it will have a time on delay. So, you know, you, you energize it and then there's a trigger input and you hit that trigger input and then say it's set to a 10 second on delay it'll wait 10 seconds and then turn on. Or if you have an off delay, it will turn on immediately. And then once you take away that trigger input to the timing relay, it'll wait 10 seconds before it turns off the output or the contacts. That brings us to our next point, which is what if you don't wanna use all that stuff? You can eliminate relays and timers by using a PLC. PLC, Programmable Logic Controller. Uh, I would say out of everything, that's probably the best skill to have. If you can, you know, navigate your way through a PLC, you're going to have a good career, um, period. You know, I always tell people uh, to get their associate's degree, but, you know, if you get really good with PLCs and circuit troubleshooting, you'll find a job somewhere for sure, but you got to put in the work and get the experience. Um, yeah, PLCs just make decisions. There's inputs going into it, either discrete, on, off, so let's say, for example, input zero, one, you're sending zero volts to it. That's going to be off. But then you apply 120 volts to it. That's going to make that input turn high. And then inside of your PLC, you're going to have all your inputs and bits and timers and decision making. You're going to draw up a bunch of diagrams. And when you, you're going to turn on outputs based on certain inputs. Um, there's different PLCs that operate at different voltages. Obviously, they all have different software packages. Alan Bradley is the industry leader, and they have different levels of PLCs. Um, some of them have analog inputs, so 0 to 100%, and some of them have analog outputs, 0 to 100%. So for an analog input, you would use that for something like you know, measuring a pressure and then making, you know, obviously decisions based off that pressure. And then your analog outputs are going to be for things like, you know, opening a proportional valve to a certain degree, or maybe you're sending a speed signal to a VFD to tell a motor how fast to run. Speaking of a VFD, a VFD is just a fancy replacement for this. This is a pretty cheap one. This whole setup right here is like a hundred bucks. Um, VFDs start around like eight, 900 and all they are, they're, they're like a contactor. They supply power to a motor. So you, you know, send, you are going to have power going to your VFD and then inside your VFD, you're going to have a bunch of parameters that you can set things like, you know, one of them is like, what do we want? When do we want to start? And you can do things like, you know, you can put a, a wire, a signal discrete signal wire to tell it to start, or you can plug it into ethernet. Um, among every, other things, you can just have it, you know, you can just have it where you have to push the button. You have speed control. 
Um, you can have an analog input. You can just use the knob on the front, things like that. But a VFD is going to um, slowly ramp up your motor. and It's also going to allow you to um, control the speed of it, among other parameters, more effectively. So VFDs are real useful if you have an extremely expensive motor that you want to protect or if you have to control the speed and monitor, you know, the ins and outs of that um, motor remotely, that VFD can, you know, send data back on what the motor is doing exactly. I think that's pretty much everything in the panel. Uh, you're also going to have terminal blocks uh, where your wires go. Let me get a little mental picture of a panel in my head. Um, you're gonna have a bunch of push buttons on the screen and also indicator lights. Um, again, industrial stuff is all meant to be worked on. So there's all different types of push buttons and indicator lights and all kinds of different stuff. What else? Oh, on your contactor, you're gonna have contacts, auxiliary contacts that will um, you know, give feedback. It will send out a signal to tell your PLC or whatever you're using. Like when you turn on this contact around, when you do that, some of these contacts will open or close so you can, you know, monitor what's going on. You also have contacts on the overload unit that will tell you if the overload unit is happy or if it's tripped. Also, another really important component that you're going to run into inside of a panel is something called a safety relay. Safety relays are safety relays. It's a... Uh, high-tech relay that monitors safety inputs. For example, let's say you have a bunch of e-stops around your device, your machine. So when you hit the e-stop, those are gonna, you know, turn off an input to the safety relay. The safety relay will turn off power to certain devices in your machine so that nothing can operate. It's um, also your safety relay is gonna monitor those inputs and look for evidence that it's a false input um, I'm not going to go much further than that, but basically it's a high tech way to monitor your e-stops, light curtains, you know, the things that when you take your guards off the machinery, if you have a little magnet switch, it's going to monitor that at a higher level than just one signal going to a relay. That just about covers all the equipment you're going to run to inside of a panel. Again, your best tools in your panel is your multimeter. Learn how to use that. Um, electrical schematics are going to come in really handy. If you can't get electrical schematics, believe it or not, you can still troubleshoot, diagnose, rewire stuff. That's where experience and skill comes in. So if you run into a situation where you're pretty new and you're having to work in a panel with no schematics, consider yourself lucky because that's how you learn. Um, always be safe. Kill the power. If you don't know what you're doing, just kill the power every time. I mean, you're going to get zapped. Um, so exercise extreme caution when you're working with 480 volt. Don't play around with 480 volts live, especially if you have less than a year of experience. But anyway, so those are common devices in the panel. Yeah, and that's pretty much it, man. That's how machines work in a nutshell. Thanks for watching.